In our last lecture, we noticed the role of reason in the mind of Edwards, especially in relation to revelation. In this lecture, I want to indicate the limitations of reason in the thinking of Jonathan Edwards. Before I do, I might mention a little detail I intended to mention earlier, and that is that this tie that I'm wearing through this little series is a tie which is an emblem of the Jonathan Edwards College at Yale University. As I mentioned before, uh, Edwards studied there and was a graduate of it in its very early days. And his manuscripts are almost all of them located at the Beinecke Library at Yale University. And Yale University Press is in the process of publishing the definitive edition of the works of Jonathan Edwards. It has reached 10 volumes. The 10th volume, which appeared last year, being the first on sermons and discourses, 1720 to 23. If Yale Press publishes all of the sermons of Edwards, the whole series will have to exceed 25 or 30 volumes. But we're grateful for the 10 volumes we have. But Jonathan Edwards College also has the famous badger portrait of Sarah and Jonathan Edwards, which you may want to see when you visit the university in that particular college. But this is their symbol of Edwards that marks this particular tie, which somebody gave me some years ago. On the limitations of reason, I note that in spite of the indispensability of reason, it does have its limitations in the thinking of Edwards, at least four of them I will mention. There are, according to Edwards, at least four limitations. First, it cannot make the knowledge of God real, quotes, real to unregenerate men. Second, it cannot yield a supernatural salvific revelation or even a sense of it. Third, if it recognizes a revelation, as it should if it's used properly, it cannot thereafter determine what that revelation may not contain. And fourth, reason cannot, quote, comprehend the revelation. First then, reason cannot make the knowledge of God real to unregenerate human reason. This is the basic point of Arminian weakness in the thinking of Jonathan Edwards. Arminians think more highly of man than they ought. I may take a moment to mention them. The deists that we referred to in the last lecture were the liberals of the 17th and 18th century. They became increasingly more liberal. At first, they believed in God, but somewhat like our own liberals, after a while they dispensed with the deity and lost almost everything else as well. But they opposed the biblical revelation and they opposed Orthodox Christianity. Now the Arminians, who began with a man of the, by the name of Arminius in the Netherlands. The original Arminius died in 1609, but the remonstrance developed his thought more radically than he entertained it and quickly went into liberalism. But when Arminianism crossed the channel to England, it was adopted by John Wesley and other leading Anglicans and it was sort of domesticated, as it were. That is, it was uh, kept from its liberal tendencies and tried to uh, be amalgamated with the Calvinistic 39 articles of the Church of England. 
Charles Wesley, the brother of John, felt that his, father, his brother went too far in that direction, and so did Jonathan Edwards. But what the Arminians were doing as over against the Calvinists to the right and the deists to the left, they maintained the basic existence of God and the revelation of Holy Scripture and the fundamental tenets of orthodoxy. But unlike the Calvinists, they didn't accept the idea that man was morally dead. Rather, he was morally dying. He needed to be rescued by the gospel, and if you reached him in time, you could save him, otherwise he would perish. But he had enough life left in him, or more strictly restored to him, that he was able to embrace the faith on his own initiative and thus, in a real sense, save himself. Now that was Edwards' main problem because most of New England quickly realized this was unmitigated heresy and really not tenable with Christianity. And this was not really tenable with the Calvinistic New England theology, but nevertheless it was acting as if it were and convincing a good many people that it was, and Edwards was therefore on guard because he felt this was far more of a threat than this would ever be, even though this re uh, preserved the essentials of Christianity, whereas this was hostile to them. Arminians think more highly of man than they ought, according to Edwards and Calvinism in general, and their apologists suppose that man's reasoning is sound enough to bring him to God. This is not Edwards' opinion, however. The Calvinistic Edwards finds fallen men quite capable of seeing the truth they do not love and therefore rejecting it even as they formulate it. As one 19th century Edwardsian Calvinist, W.G.T. Shedd, S-H-E-D-D, -D, put it, the approbation of the good is not the love of it. Reason does not necessarily lead to righteousness. There is no salvation without reason, but there is reason without salvation. Nor does it necessarily lead us out of every theological problem. There are apparent theological discrepancies in Scripture which Edwards cannot reconcile and which he does not suppose that God expects man to be capable of reconciling. In natural theology, no less than revealed theology, the conception of infinity, for example, is utterly baffling to Edwards. Therefore, to reject everything but what we can first see to be agreeable to our reason tends by degree to bring everything relating not only to revealed religion but even natural religion into doubt. It follows that although revelation must be demonstrable, rationally demonstrable, the attempt to make it always comprehensible would tend at last, says Edwards, to make men esteem the science of religion as of no value, and so totally neglect it, and from step to step it will lead to skepticism, atheism, ignorance, and at length to barbarity. Thus, according to Edwards, too great a demand for understanding leads at last to no understanding. Reason is a useful and necessary tool for any serious thinker, though the human mind must be satisfied with its limitations. As he didn't see Arminianism being satisfied. Second, it cannot yield a supernatural revelation or even an awareness of it. This does not mean that it cannot and does not point 
to such a revelation and prove it. Only it cannot bring the sinner even partway, as the Arminians thought it could, to accept that revelation. It couldn't bring the sinner even partway to accept that revelation savingly. And since it's transforming truth, but no way at all in that domain. Here is where Edwards' is real difference with deism, ultimate difference with deism is seen. This type of criticism goes back to the deists of the 18th century. Tyndall's Bible of the Deists, as it was called, was entitled Christianity as Old as Creation, or the Gospel, a republication of the religion of nature. For him and all deists, natural revelation was a sufficient map for the rational voyage of life. Revelation was unnecessary and impertinence and unable in any case to move beyond unaided reason. 19th century Gordon and 20th century Gay, Princeton, are the same persuasion. Consequently, all of them lament Edwards with all his prodigious ability as a philosopher and natural theologian bowing before the authority of Scripture, like a little child singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But for Edwards, this attitude was not one of simple piety alone. He refuted the deists not by an appeal to faith, but by rational analysis. He did not prove the deists to de be deficient in heart, but soft in the head. In the preceding chapter, I've gone into some of that. And I sketched there somewhat of the famous 1340 miscellany. But Edwards' fundamental rational argument against Tyndall's proposition is that virtually all reasoning consists, quote, in discovering the truth of a proposition whose truth does not appear to our reason immediately or when we consider it alone, but by the help of some other proposition on which it depends. Now, this is a little complicated, and yet the argument is very important. So let me read this statement of Edwards' precise critique of deism at this point. In discovering the truth of a proposition, there is a God or there is an incarnate Son of God or whatever it may be, in discovering the truth of, the prop of a proposition whose truth does not appear to our reason immediately or when we consider it alone, but by the help of some other proposition on which it depends. Indeed, there are some propositions from whence an infinite multitude of other propositions are inferred and reasonably, justly determined to be true. Otherwise, they could not actually be a part of the proposition. You see, what the deists were trying to do was once they proved there was a God, they thought they therefore proved it was unnecessary to have a revelation of God. Now, Edwards is arguing just exactly the opposite. Once you establish a proposition, it rests on certain prior propositions, and it leads to certain subsequent propositions. So for the deists to stop once they learn something from their intellectual investigations, which are commendable investigations leading to a defensible proposition is utterly inexcusable because it rests on prior 
propositions and it would lead to others. And in this particular case, what he's saying is, if we know there's a God, we know there's a possibility of a revelation of God. If you could prove there's no God, then of course a non-God could not reveal himself. But if you prove there's a God, so far from that terminating the discussion, that lays the foundation, at least for the possibility of a revelation of God, the existence of which and the reality of which will depend on subsequent investigation, is what Edwards is saying. Now third, if reason recognizes a revelation, it cannot thereafter determine what that revelation may and may not contain. In a certain sense, this is where the Arminians come into the problem. The deists get off the train as soon as they realize there is a God and say irrationally, we've no need for a revelation of God when God should determine such a matter as that. Now in this third limitation of reason, it recognizes a revelation, but then wants to say what that revelation must contain. And as far as Arminianism is concerned, as Edward shows in his greatest work on the freedom of the will, Arminians have a certain idea of what human choices must be and imposes those ideas on the scripture. Whereas rationally, if the scripture is the word of God, Arminians and everyone else should wait on scripture to tell us what is the nature of man and his choices and so on. If reason recognizes a revelation, it cannot thereafter determine what that revelation may and may not contain. This is the real emphasis epistemologically of Jonathan Edwards. It wanted to claim for reason what only revelation could do in the case of the deists and what only the revelation could reveal according to the Arminians and neither one of them had a justification because they did not recognize that third limitation of reason. We'll notice this especially as we come shortly now to a study of Edwards's understanding of the Bible as revelation and preaching of it. But in his great work on the freedom of the will, the thing he's showing about the Arminians is that they are twisting scripture constantly and making it say something it doesn't say because they have the conviction independently of revelation what scripture would have to say. The Arminians don't always recognize that. Calvin admits, I mean Edwards admits, but at the same time that's the principle they're operating on. The deists were fully aware of what they were doing. The Arminians weren't always conscious of what they were doing or they might have been appalled and stopped doing it because they did believe the Bible was the word of God and deserved the reference, the reverence that goes with the word of God. But four, reason cannot comprehend. That's Edwards' word, comprehend. That's, quote, divine revelation. This, of course, surprises you and you realize he has a very loaded meaning for this word, comprehend. Just the opposite. If this is a revelation of God, then manifestly, God can easily go over our head and God can reveal something in the context of the understood that goes far beyond anything that the human mind can comprehend. Edwards then concludes the essay by explaining that difficulties in understanding the doctrine of God are to be expected in matters so transcendent. The appearance of such paradoxes, which are everywhere present, argues for, not against, the revelation and its reliability. Edwards' parting sally is amusing. He twits the deists with this remark. 
if the light of nature were sufficient, as the deists maintain, why do they bother building schools? <coughs> this really caught the deists because they were great educators, always stressing the necessity of educating the unenlightened mind in deistic ways and so on. But if nature revealed everything that needed to be known, why did man have to build schools? In this way, Edwards refuted the deist's a priori objection to special revelation. It is unreasonably maintained to question rationally anything taught by revelation. I repeat, it was, he maintained rationally anything taught by revelation would be irrational to question. Proceeding from the rationally established general principle that the Bible is the Word of God, sound reason dictates the acceptance of all its teaching. To make these teaching pass tests of reason once their divine authorship was shown is as unreasonable as it is impious. I repeat, there is integration in Edwards, and that is not reluctantly and unwittingly, nor by a double standard of authority, flatly postulated by Jonathan Edwards, quote, following his own rules of debate and evidence. In my book, I devote a number of pages to a refutation of this quoted critique of Jonathan Edwards by one of the outstanding researchers in Edwards in our present day. Their doctoral dissertations or Edwards are pouring out by the dozen. And many American scholars and European scholars also are busily pouring over the writings of this genius of the 18th century. But one of them makes this particular criticism of Edwards's intellectualism. And as I say in my book, the very first volume, I devote a number of pages to show this is an utterly unjust and unfair criticism. But let me re read it again. I repeat, there is integration, which this scholar is denying, in Edwards. And that is not reluctantly and unwittingly, as he maintains, but or by a double standard of authority, flatly, he means dogmatically, posited by Jonathan Edwards, following his own rules of debate and evidence. I mean, when I first read that statement, I passed into a state of apoplexy because it's been generally recognized, not just by myself, but by multitudes of persons who study Edwards who do not agree with Edwards, as well as many who do agree with him, that this man was intellectually consistent throughout. And while he had a role for mystery, as we have noted, there's no fideism here. There's no arbitrary creating of an Edwardsian pattern of reason, which he rather reluctantly gives in order to maintain his reputation for 18th century orthodoxy or something like that. What I'm saying to this particular scholar, and I won't mention his name here, but in the volume, his name is mentioned and his book is mentioned, and his argument is mentioned in particular. Edwards gave these arguments as coming right out of his gut, as it were, right out of his own observation, which he felt was demonstrated by the reason which he presented which was in no way uniquely Edwardsian and which appealed to no particular canons or prejudice of his or was arbitrarily postulated, somewhat the way Immanuel Kant would postulate categorical imperatives and other kinds of arguments for God that couldn't be demonstrated by rationality. When I throw out that incidental comparison to Kant, a man did write an interesting study comparing Jonathan Edwards with 
Immanuel Kant and trying to show a similarity to Kant, who nevertheless did postulate what he couldn't prove, whereas Jonathan Edwards postulated only what he felt he had demonstrated by rationality that was open to anybody's observation and operated according to the rules that any person, be he atheist, agnostic, or theist, actually accepted and operated upon and admitted to be cogent if such principles were observed. Now, whether Jonathan Edwards succeeds in rationally proving the existence of God and his revelation is for the reader to judge. But there can be no question that he tried to do so. And in the opinion of this particular student of Edwards, he succeeded. But that's for you to determine. In the next lecture, we'll focus more closely on this matter of the mystery of revelation.